If you take a trip to Hawaii, there's a good chance you'll visit the beautiful Rainbow Falls on the eastern side of the Big Island. But if you travel less than a mile upstream of those falls, you'll find an equally beautiful attraction that far less people know about, and it's called the Boiling Pots. 10,000 years ago, after a volcanic eruption, lava was flowing down the side of the mountain when it entered the Wailuku River. As the lava gradually cooled, the river water flowing all around it wound up carving out these standalone pools of water that were connected by a series of small waterfalls. These pools collectively make up the boiling pots, and they get their name because periodically the water in these pools appears to be boiling. Tourists at the boiling pots are allowed to look at the water from a safe distance on the cement overlook, but under no circumstances are allowed to actually enter the water. In 2015, Jolie Ricewig was a 62-year-old woman living in Kona, Hawaii, which is on the western side of the island. There, she owned a bed and breakfast, whose main allure was that guests at this bed and breakfast got to go on these fun adventure tours with Jolie all over the island. And they almost always involved paddleboarding or swimming, because Jolie was an avid outdoors person and a very talented swimmer and swim instructor, and so felt comfortable leading these types of excursions. On September 14th of that year, Jolie brought one of her male guests from her bed and breakfast out for an adventure tour at the Boiling Pots. She would have known that it was an off-limits area for swimmers because there were signs up everywhere saying as much, but Jolie wasn't planning to swim in the Boiling Pots. Instead, she was planning to float on them on inflatable rafts. And so she and this man climbed aboard their respective rafts and began paddling around one of the upper pools, taking in the incredible view of this natural phenomenon. As they were relaxing, suddenly there was this rush of water that came tumbling over the fall that dumped down into the pool they were in. It was a flash flood. And before Jolie and this man could swim outside of the pool and get to safety, the water under them began to churn violently and actually thrust them over the edge down into the next pool. And as soon as they hit the water, they had fallen off of their rafts. So now they're swimming in the water and they're feeling a current pulling them down and pulling them forward towards the next lip into the next pool. And so they both began desperately swimming towards the edge. Jolie actually grabbed the man and helped push him up and out to safety. And as soon as he was on land, he turned around to grab her, but she wasn't there. And so he's looking around and all he can see is her raft floating on the surface being taken down into the rapids. And so he thinks, okay, she must have fallen into the next pool. And so on the side of the waterway, he runs down and he's looking into the next pool, the next pool, the next pool, and she's nowhere to be found. And after a few minutes of looking and not knowing where she was, he called the authorities. They came out and they launched this huge search for her, but despite searching the entirety of the boiling pots and all the way downstream, there was no sign of her. And after looking for an entire week, they never found anything. It was like she just disappeared, and so they turned the search off. As devastating as this was for the family to not have closure about what happened to Jolie, this was not a surprising outcome. In fact, it was almost an expected outcome considering why the boiling pots are off limits to swimmers. Each of the pools of water that make up the boiling pots is a deep, nearly vertical shaft of water, and at the bottom of it are these entrances to these underground tunnels, and these entrances are big enough for a person to slip inside of. And these tunnels are not short. They go on for a long ways in all different directions. In a flash flood scenario, that increased water that's flowing down the boiling pots creates this unbelievable current that inside of each of these pools is pulling straight down, which gives the water the impression that it's boiling, because basically the water's tumbling over as it's being filtered up and down inside of this vertical shaft. And so if you get grabbed by this current, it's going to pull you down and into one of these tunnels, and you won't get out again unless the current releases you. And so Jolie, after helping her guest get out of the water to safety, she was pulled down and into one of these tunnels, and she was held there for five months until finally the current released her, and her remains were spotted just below the pots in a tide pool. Our next story is called Out on a Limb. On the evening of March 25, 2017, a 25-year-old farmer named Akbar Solobiro was harvesting palm fruit at the local oil palm grove near his tiny village in Indonesia. 
Now, the way Akbar would do this is he would use this long curved pole and he would prod at the bright red fruit in the tree, knocking it to the ground, and then he would gather it up, put it in his cart, and wheel it back home to be sold for palm oil. Now, on this night, Akbar was actually working later than usual because his wife and kids were out of town for a couple of days visiting family, and so there was no real reason to head back home because the house was empty. But Akbar was actually just fine with that because there was tons of ripe fruit, and so staying late would be quite profitable. But after a while, when the sun had finally set and it was getting difficult to actually even see the fruit in the tree, Akbar knew he really needed to leave soon because this area at night was actually not safe. And so Akbar gathered up the remainder of his fruit on the ground, he put his pole in the cart as well, and he began quickly making his way back home. Later that evening, one of Akbar's neighbors was asleep in their bed inside of their home when they woke up suddenly to the sound of something out in the jungle, not far from where Akbar had been harvesting palm fruit. And so this neighbor, when they sat up, they couldn't really tell what the sound was. It almost sounded like a stifled scream or maybe some animal that was fighting with another animal. But as the neighbor sat there straining their ears to try to hear it again, they didn't. All they heard was normal sounds coming from the outside. And so the neighbor decided that the sound they heard must have been a cat or maybe a monkey. And, you know, whatever it was, it couldn't have been a big deal. And so this neighbor went back to sleep. The following evening, so 24 hours later, another one of Akbar's neighbors walked outside of their home to begin the walk over to the jungle to harvest palm fruit. And when they went outside, normally around this time, Akbar would be coming outside as well, because these two often went to the grove together. But, you know, this neighbor is looking and Akbar's not outside, and he looks up at Akbar's house and it's dark and quiet. And so this neighbor's thinking to themselves, you know, where is Akbar? You know, I know he worked late last night. I didn't hear him come in. And come to think of it, you know, I haven't seen him all day. And now, of course, I'm not seeing him as well. And so this neighbor, feeling concerned about Akbar, walked over and knocked on his door, but nobody answered. And so really starting to think that something could be wrong with Akbar, this neighbor went to Akbar's uncle's house. And when Akbar's uncle came to the door, this neighbor explained what was going on and their concern that, you know, something could have happened to Akbar. And so the uncle and this neighbor would go back over to Akbar's home and they would actually try the door. It was locked. They looked inside the windows and it looked like no one was in there. And they also noticed that where Akbar typically kept his cart that he would transport his fruit in, it wasn't there either, which made them think, you know, Akbar must still be out somewhere with this cart because this cart is very important to him. And so ultimately, the uncle, after seeing the state of his nephew's home, he agreed with this neighbor that, you know, something was wrong here. And if they wanted to find Akbar, they really needed to get together a search party right now and go looking for him. So the uncle contacted the leaders of the village, and they, in turn, rounded up all the able-bodied men in the village, and they all got together with headlamps and flashlights and machetes and knives, and then all together, they began walking away from the village into the jungle in the direction of this palm grove, which was the place that Akbar had been last. And so this big group of men, they get inside the jungle, and they begin walking along this path, which was the most likely path that Akbar would have taken to go to the palm grove and also to return from the palm grove. And as they're walking, you know, the sun is starting to set, it's getting dark, and the animals in the jungle, they're all making noises and kind of yelling at this group as they're moving through. And this group, they're shining their light around looking for any sign of Akbar, but there wasn't any. They were calling his name out, there was no response. And then at some point, as they got closer to the palm grove, they noticed there were a couple of bright red fruits, palm fruits, that had clearly been recently harvested that were scattered on the trail. And so the group began to fan out in this area, thinking that, oh my goodness, Akbar must be somewhere nearby. You know, maybe there was some sort of accident and he's fallen somewhere, or just something's happened to him, but he's got to be in this area. And so the group began fanning out off the trail, kind of hacking their way through all the underbrush. And then suddenly, one of the men, after he hacked through a particularly dense stretch of the jungle, he looked down and saw something and began to scream, and he raised his machete and began running forward. As far as we can tell, this is what happened to Akbar. The previous night, after Akbar had decided, you know, it wasn't safe to be in the jungle at night, he needed to leave, and so he gathered up all of his things, and he began walking along that path where the search party would find all that fruit scattered on the trail. And so he's walking along this path, 
and he thinks he's alone, he thinks he's okay, but in reality, he wasn't. He was being watched and followed very closely from something up in the trees. And so as Akbar moved along, this thing was kind of trailing him and seeing what he was going to do. And then at some point, this thing up in the trees began moving its way down closer and closer to Akbar. It was a 23-foot-long reticulated python. It was a massive snake. And this snake came down and launched an attack on Akbar, grabbing the back of his neck with its powerful jaws. And as soon as the snake clamped down on Akbar's neck, he let out a stifled scream, which was the scream that had woken up that other neighbor who sat up in bed wondering what that was. That was Akbar screaming out. But that was the only sound Akbar could make, because immediately the snake wrapped itself all around Akbar and squeezed him tight. And after crushing Akbar, breaking almost every bone in his body, the snake relaxed and then slithered off of Akbar. And so Akbar fell to the ground and was either dead or very close to death. And at this point, the snake opened up its jaws and positioned itself right in front of Akbar's head. And then it began kind of slithering itself forward, consuming Akbar head first. And the way pythons do this is they don't really chew on their victim. Instead, they kind of put their mouth over the top of whatever they're going to consume, and they kind of undulate and walk their bodies forward, driving the victim deeper and deeper into their body until they are completely consumed. And so the next night, when one of the members of the search party had gone off the trail and began hacking away and then saw something and charged after it with his machete, what he was seeing was the python who very clearly had a person inside of its stomach. You could see the outline of the person. And so this search party member ran forward and hacked the snake, opened it up, and there was Akbar fully dressed and deceased inside of the snake. The next and final story of today's episode is called The Popelik Monster. While she was in high school in Dayton, Ohio, Raquel Bain became known as a bit of a thrill seeker, primarily because she would do something called car surfing, which is exactly what it sounds like. She would climb on to the exterior of cars and hold on to the roof while somebody else drove it around. In addition to seeking out these physical thrills, Raquel was also drawn to psychological ones, like going to places that were supposedly haunted and seeing if she could spook herself. Following high school, Raquel kind of calmed down and became less of the wild teenager she was known for being, and instead she really focused on building a life and a career for herself. And so she would go to college, and she would earn her degree in surgical technologies, and then by 2009, she was employed full-time as a surgical assistant in Dayton. Also around that time, she had her first child, a son, who she adored. But despite creating this life full of stereotypically adult, mature things, like having a career and starting a family, deep down, Raquel was still very much the thrill-seeking wild teenager she was back in high school. But as an adult, she just never had time to go seek out those thrills. So with that in mind, fast forward to April of 2016. By this point, Raquel is 26 years old. And that month, a very rare weekend popped up where Raquel did not have to work and she didn't have any childcare responsibilities. And so wanting to take advantage of this free time, Raquel asked her boyfriend, 41-year-old David Nee, if he would join her on a road trip that weekend to Louisville, Kentucky, where Raquel wanted to check out the infamously scary Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Back in the 1900s, Waverly Hills was a place where tuberculosis patients were sent. Tuberculosis, or TB for short, is an infection of the lungs and it can be deadly. Today, there's a cure for it, but back in the early 1900s, there wasn't. And so most of the people who went to Waverly Hills died there, and usually very slowly and painfully, and in total isolation from their families, because in virtue of being sent to Waverly Hills, they were effectively being quarantined to stop the spread of the disease. 
Waverly Hills would eventually shut down permanently in 1961 because by that point the cure had been found, and after it shut down, the building basically just sat there. Nobody else came in and turned it into anything else. And so this building is basically abandoned, and lots of people began sneaking in to see what it was like in there, and a shocking number of these trespassers reported seeing ghosts inside. Today, the sanatorium is still very much in the same condition it was left in, but the Waverly Hills Historical Society has stepped in and made it very hard for people to sneak into the building. However, knowing people do want to go in and look around, the Historical Society has begun offering guided tours of the sanatorium, and these tours are given exclusively at night to increase the spooky effect. And so David, who had only been dating Raquel for a month when she asked him to come with her to the sanatorium, he was not really that keen on doing this. It did not really appeal to him to go walking around this totally terrifying place, but he could tell it was important to Raquel, she was really excited about it, and so he agreed to go. A few days later, on the late afternoon of April 23rd, the new couple left Raquel's place, they climbed into the car, and they began driving south. Three hours later, they arrived in Louisville, and they stopped to get dinner, and then after they were done eating, they looked at the time and realized it was only about 6.45 p.m., and the tour they had scheduled at the sanatorium was not until 10 p.m., so they had a few hours to kill. And before David could suggest anything, Raquel already had the perfect idea of how they should kill this time. She told David that earlier that day, she had learned about a spot just outside of Louisville that might actually be more terrifying than the sanatorium they had come all this way to see. And so Raquel wanted to spend these few hours checking out this new spooky spot. This spooky spot was a rickety old, narrow, abandoned-looking bridge called the Pope Lick Trestle. It's located just east of downtown Louisville in this heavily wooded area. The bridge is about 800 feet long, and at its highest point, right in the middle of the bridge, it's about 90 to 100 feet off the ground. And this bridge connects the tops of two of the bigger rolling hills in the area. But the bridge's physical appearance has nothing to do with why it's considered so spooky. The reason the Pope Lick Trestle has become a central part of Kentucky folklore is because locals say there is a monster called the Pope Lick Monster that lives underneath the bridge. It's half goat, half man, and when anyone is near this bridge at night, this monster is supposed to come out from underneath this bridge, and then what happens next is very ambiguous. It kind of depends on who you're talking to. But generally speaking, once the Poplick monster has emerged and it sees you, you're dead. Now, how you die ranges from the monster leaping out and attacking you with an axe to the monster using some sort of mind control to lure you up onto the bridge where you leap off. David, after hearing this suggestion, was again not really that keen to go do this really terrifying sounding thing, but seeing the excitement in his girlfriend's face, he agreed to go. And so the two left the restaurant, they climbed back in the car, and they drove for about 15 or 20 minutes to the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge. The bridge actually passed over a relatively main road, and so the couple parked just off the side of this main road. And then once they were outside, they began looking for a pathway up this hillside to get up to the bridge. And very quickly, they found a well-worn dirt path that snaked up the side of this wooded hillside that looked very much like it would bring them up to the bridge. So with Raquel in front and David behind her, they began walking up this dirt path. And as they're walking, they start to see signs that clearly say, no trespassing. But they ignore them because they're looking at this path thinking, okay, lots of people clearly come up here, so we've got to be okay. And so they keep on walking up this path and they're getting closer and closer to the top of this hill where they think it's going to connect with this bridge. And right as they're getting close, they see there's this huge chain link fence, this eight foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire across the top that extends in either direction out of view. And so the couple walks up to this fence and there are more signs that say no trespassing, private property, and there are additional warning signs saying that what is on the other side of this fence is also just plain dangerous, so turn around and leave.
But as Raquel and David are staring at all these signs and this fence, they see, not far from the path, somebody had clearly bent two of the fence posts and created a narrow gap in the fence that you could slip through. And so from David and Raquel's perspective, that looked like the way other trespassers must have found their way up to the bridge, and so it must be safe. And so once again, the couple disregarded all the warnings, they made their way over to this gap in the fence, they both slipped through, and they kept on walking up the hill. Just a couple of minutes later, they reached this clearing, which was at the top of this hill, and once they were in this clearing, they were able to turn, and they could actually see the bridge. It was only a couple hundred feet away from them. And it was totally intimidating. By this point, it's totally dark out, and from their perspective, all they see is this very narrow bridge that they know is 100 feet off the ground at certain points, and they can see there's no guardrails on either side of this bridge. It would have almost looked like a tightrope kind of extending off into the darkness. But even if the couple was really intimidated by the sight of this bridge and with all these warning signs before it, they were able to put their fear aside and just keep on going. And so with David now in the lead and Raquel behind him, they walked the couple of hundred feet over to the start of this narrow bridge. And when they got there, without actually stepping onto the bridge, David came to a stop. He turned around to face Raquel and he gestured for her to come stand next to him so they could take a selfie with the bridge in the background. Because David at this point is thinking, we're not going to go on this bridge. We're just going to look at this bridge, take some pictures, and then we'll go. But Raquel, who he's looking at, gesturing to come stand with him, just walks right past him onto the bridge and takes several steps out onto this narrow, rickety old thing. And then she stops, turns around, and gestures for David to come with her and walk across the entire bridge. And David, again, is having his second thoughts, but he sees Raquel wants to do this, and so he agrees to go. After they had walked about 100, maybe 200 feet across this bridge, the two of them just started laughing because it was totally exhilarating what they were doing. Not so much the quest for the Popelik monster, but rather the very real risk they were taking walking this tightrope bridge in the middle of the night. The couple would continue to very cautiously but quickly make their way across this bridge, and when they reached about the halfway point, when they were at the highest point from the ground, the bridge itself begins to shake. And then from behind them, they hear this loud grinding sound. And so the couple, they whip their heads around and they see there are these two bright glowing lights that are looking right at them all the way on the start of the bridge. And they realize it's a train. When Raquel and David walked up that dirt path and snuck through the fence and reached the top of the hill and could actually see the Pope Lick Trestle Bridge, they would have also seen the train tracks in the hillside that clearly extended onto the Popelik trestle and went across the bridge. This was a train bridge. They would have seen that. But it's assumed that the couple who didn't live in the area and so didn't know much about the Popelik trestle, it's assumed they thought, well, you know, this is a train bridge, but it's got to be abandoned. It certainly looks abandoned, and it does. It looks totally old. It does not look active, even though it is. Or the couple thought, well, this is just an old train bridge. It might be active, but surely no train is going to come through anytime soon. We can get across the bridge before a train arrives. But of course, they were wrong. When the couple turned around and saw these two headlights bearing down on them, they quickly realized they would not be able to outrun this train. The train's clearly trying to stop. It has seen them. It's hitting its brakes. It's sounding its horn, but it's just clearly moving too quickly. So they cannot run to the other side to safety. And because this bridge was meant for a single train to pass through, there was no other track they could just jump onto to avoid being hit. And there were no walkways on either side of this railway. And so literally all they had was the track that this train was going to cross over and they were on it. And so with no other choices, David yells to Raquel that they have to climb down and hang off the side of this bridge. Now, there were these wooden slats that ran underneath the rails. They ran perpendicular to the rails. And these wooden slats kind of extended off the edge of the bridge on either side just a couple of inches. And so in theory, if you were holding onto the outside of one of these wooden slats and kind of dangling off the edge of the bridge, 
A train could cross those tracks and not run over your hands or fingers. You would just have to hold on that whole time as the train is rumbling through. And so David, he flops down onto his stomach and he's trying to lower himself as fast as he can as this train is getting closer and closer. And he's yelling for Raquel to do the same thing, but she's not really moving very quickly. And finally, David, he gets in position. He's hanging off the edge of this bridge on these wooden slats and he sees Raquel. She's not quite there. And then the train comes flying through. It strikes Raquel and sends her flying off the bridge to the ground below. David would somehow manage to hold on the whole time as this train went past him. And then once the train had passed him, he pulled himself back up onto the tracks. He ran the rest of the way across the bridge. He went down that hillside. And when he found Raquel, it was immediately apparent that she was deceased. In the end, the railroad was not issued any citations or sued for negligence. It was determined they did their due diligence by setting up that eight foot tall barbed wire fence with all those signs telling people to stay back and warning people about the hazards of going past this fence. It was actually David who got in trouble for this tragedy. He was cited and charged with a felony of unlawfully disrupting and or delaying a train causing financial damages. He would plead to a lesser charge of trespassing and would be fined $2,300. Shockingly, this tragedy is just one of many that have occurred on the Popelik Trestle Bridge. Since the bridge's construction in the 1800s, there have been dozens of people who have died on this bridge. And several of these deaths, many of them fairly recent, the last 20 or so years, have occurred under the same conditions as Raquel's. People went looking for the Popelik monster and then were struck by a train. 2006, Susan Lewis and her daughter Jamie moved into a new home in Southern California. It was this nice little house that they referred to as their sanctuary. They loved it there. And shortly after moving in, Susan's new boyfriend, Matt, he moved in as well. Matt and Jamie got along great. Also, Matt had a daughter named Marie, who was the same age as Jamie. And so those two got along great. Susan and Matt are getting along great. One happy family living in this beautiful little home that they call their sanctuary. I mean, it's a charmed life. Everything would change when the peanut butter spilled. A few weeks after moving in, it's this beautiful summer day and Matt and Jamie and Marie are all outside goofing around in the pool and Susan steps away from them to go into the house to make lunch for the group. Susan goes into the kitchen and she sees on the counter that a peanut butter jar had its lid off and had been turned on its side. And oddly enough, the peanut butter seemed to be running out of the jar like it had been melted. It was like in a liquid state pouring out of the jar and had gone all over the ground. She felt the temperature in the air and it wasn't very hot. So she figures one of the kids must have come in here and for whatever reason, microwaved the peanut butter and then dumped it on the counter. And so she reflexively turns around. She's like, Jamie, her daughter, Jamie, get in here. Jamie comes inside and she's like, what mom? And she's like, did you do this? And Jamie would say that she literally laughed at her mom. Like, why would I do that? And her mom's like, well, I don't know. Did, do you know if Marie did this? And she's like, no, we've been outside. So she shoes her daughter away and she calls in Marie and Marie too is like, no, I, I didn't touch the peanut butter. Susan ultimately just kind of says, okay, the kids don't want to own up to it. It's a great day today. I'm not gonna let this ruin it. And so she's kind of rationalizing what's going on. She's thinking, okay, one of the kids must have knocked it over without meaning to, and maybe it was warmer in here and I just didn't realize it and it melted. Any number of things could have been the reason for this, but I just don't care. After cleaning up the peanut butter, Susan leaves the house and they, all four of them, spend the rest of the day goofing around outside near the pool. When they come back in the house later that day, they find that there have been cans that you would keep in your pantry, like canned food, stacked on each of the steps leading upstairs. They also find that there have been random objects placed all over the house in strange patterns. In the bathroom, they find shampoo bottles stacked on top of one another, hairbrushes arranged in a star pattern on the counter. They open the microwave and find peanut butter jars and other random canned foods and stuffed animals from the kids' rooms in the microwave. The cleaning materials underneath the sink had been pulled out and arranged in a height line from shortest to tallest on the kitchen floor. Also, there were just strange liquids all over the walls. It looked like maybe ketchup or other sauces. They couldn't really tell what it was, but it was sprayed all over the house. There was shampoo on the walls and soap on the walls. And so when Susan and Matt and the girls go inside, 
they think that someone's invaded their house. So they run back out again. They're kind of looking around the property, wondering what they should do. And no one's come near their property and they would have seen someone come to their property. So they start filming it. They go in and they film what's going on. That's why we have all these pictures and they have no idea what to make of this. Matt believes it's Jamie. So not his biological daughter. Susan believes it's his daughter, Marie, and it starts this awful conflict between Matt and Susan. This would be the start of what would turn out to be a major fracture in this family because it just continued to grow. You got to put yourself in their position. If you're Matt or Susan, you don't want this to be anything other than one of the kids did this. If it's not one of the kids, it means you had an intruder in your home. If it's not an intruder, then what caused it? They believe that the other child is doing this. They believed it so much that they did not see reason. But more than that, it would keep Matt and Susan from handling this the way I think anyone should have, which is get the police involved. They don't. So they start cleaning it up and the house was really a mess. So it took quite a while to clean it up. And they ultimately just kind of moved on in that way that people who are in denial move on because you're in denial. That's what they were doing. So a week passes since finding their house in disarray with cans and jars all over the place and liquids on the walls. And Jamie and Marie are spending some time together in Jamie's room. Marie was sitting at a desk that was next to the bed and Jamie had a cup of coffee. She puts the cup of coffee down on the desk next to Marie and says, I have to go use the bathroom. She turns around, she walks out, she comes back and Marie has her head down in her homework. She's not apparently paying attention to anything around her. And Jamie walks in and sees that the cup of coffee that had been sitting on the desk has now been thrown all over her bed. And there's only been one person inside of the room and that's been Marie. She's like, Marie, what are you doing? Why'd you throw my coffee all over the bed? And Marie pokes her head up and she's like, what are you talking about? And she looks over at the coffee and she's just as surprised as Jamie is. She's like, I didn't do that. Jamie doesn't believe Marie. She's mad at her because Jamie believed that Marie was the one responsible for placing the cans and everything all over the house. And so this was just another example of her trying to get attention or something like that. Jamie leaves the room to get some bleach. She comes back and she puts the bleach down on her dresser. She had all her drawers open with her clothes out. And she has this bottle of bleach sitting right at the top of this dresser. And so she goes over to the bed, picks up the cup itself that had the coffee. She puts that back on the table, turns around to get the bleach and the cap has been turned off and it's now dumping bleach all over her clothes. It's just pouring out. Marie had been sitting in the chair the whole time and Jamie had seen her the whole time. And so when she sees the bleach dumping all over her clothes, she knows it could not have been Marie. So she screams, Marie looks over, she sees what's going on, she screams. Susan hears this and comes charging in the room and she's like, what's going on? The girls can't describe what's going on. And as they're standing there, a picture frame falls off the wall and it startles them all. They're looking over and then another picture falls. It's one thing to have one picture fall, but to have two fall in close succession to one another, that's, that's not a coincidence. Susan sees the pictures fall. She hears her kids in hysterics and they run out of there. They get in the car and actually just leave the house because the girls just did not want to be there. This was a big moment in this story because to this point, Jamie, without saying anything, believed Marie was responsible for placing everything around the house and making a mess in the house. Marie felt the same way about Jamie. Again, they didn't say it to each other, but it's how they rationalized it. Susan was doing the same thing, but for both of the kids. She basically believed that either Marie or Jamie had placed the cans all over the house. Now, Susan is starting to believe that something else is going on in the house. And Marie and Jamie absolutely believe something is going on in the house. They actually suggested that we believe our house is haunted. At some point after driving around, Susan and Jamie and Marie go back to the house. Matt has been at work the whole time, so he's not there. When they get back to the house, the house is once again covered in cans all up the stairs, placed in weird orientations on the ground, things in the microwave. The fridge has been opened, all the food's been dumped out. There's liquids all over the wall and they hadn't been there and neither had Matt. Now combine it with the fact that you just had this coffee and bleach incident and the picture's fallen off the wall. They're talking about the house being haunted. You can imagine what it was like to walk into that house and see it like that all over again when it could not have been. Jamie or Marie or Susan. When Matt came home that night, he was just more convinced that it had to have been Marie or Jamie or even Susan because Susan's acting like something's going on here, something paranormal's going on here and he's he wasn't there. 
He, di he didn't see the coffee and bleach incident. He didn't see the pictures falling off the wall. And now he sees his girlfriend kind of buying into this idea that it's some paranormal thing. He was a really intense skeptic and was just absolutely unwilling to see this as anything other than a bad prank that now his girlfriend is even getting in on. It causes a huge fight between him and Susan. He's like, why are you letting the kids doing this? Why are you feeding into this? She's saying, you don't get it. There's something wrong with this house. Practically at each other's throats, they pick the house up again, it takes forever. They put everything back. And by the end of it, it's like no one wants to talk to each other. The kids are fighting with each other. Susan and Matt practically hate each other. And that's how that night wraps up. That night, all the power went out in the house. And all they heard all night was doors banging nonstop. And their stove is set to light. So all you hear is that clicking sound. They couldn't get it to turn off. I mean, right in front of them, there's all this paranormal activity and they're recording it. And they have no idea what to do. Even though we view this story and say, come on guys, either this is an elaborate hoax or you gotta go to the police. You gotta do something right here. You're doing it wrong. You're in denial, you're fighting with each other. You can't do that. You gotta do something about this. But now put yourself in their position. Their world has been completely turned upside down. Everything they believed and understood about the world is being questioned right now. They are trying to hold on to every last shred of that former life and understanding of life that they had before this haunting began. And so they don't handle this well. They just continue to fight and to be at each other's throats, blaming each other for all the things that are blatantly happening in front of them that have nothing to do with Matt, Susan, Jamie, or Marie. So at this point, Susan and Matt and the girls have not told any of their friends or other family members about what's going on. So the next day, Susan would actually go to her close friend and say, Here's what's going on and I have no idea what to do. And her friend would say, maybe you ought to try giving it a peace offering. Maybe this thing in your house, you know, feels like you're intruding. And if you offer some sort of peace offering to demonstrate that you mean no harm, that you wanna coexist, that maybe it'll, it'll get along with you. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll stop. So whether this was good advice or not, we don't know. But Susan finally has something that she has control over. And she really gets into this. She gets the girl, she knows Matt's gonna be out for the day at work, and she knows Matt would not be cool with doing this. He would not believe that offering a, a peace offering is gonna do any good. It would just cause more fights. And so she saw this window of time to take the girls and do this peace offering. She had this little figurine, it was a, a cat figurine. Susan loved cats, and she figured that a cat represented something she loved, and so it would be the perfect kind of deliberate intentional offering showing that she means no harm, they mean no harm, let's kind of call it truce here. And she puts candles on this table and she puts the cat right in the middle and she doesn't know what to say or how to do it. And the girls are just sitting there like, what's happening here? And Susan just kind of says, please accept this gift. Uh, it's my gift to you, we mean no harm and we want to coexist. And it just so happens that as they're performing this kind of ritual, Matt came home. He had not slept the night before. It had been a really bad night with the slamming of doors and all that craziness. And so he left work early. He called in sick basically. And he comes into the house and literally sees Susan doing this kind of ritual with his daughter and his stepdaughter. And he immediately goes to like, absolutely not. We're not gonna go to trying to interact with this thing. We're not gonna act like it's real. It's not real. And so he goes over and he kind of picks up on what they're doing, that this cat figurine is at the center of attention. And, you know, Susan and the girls are telling him, don't do anything, don't touch it. And he takes the figurine and he walks out to the back deck and he throws it onto their backyard. And Susan and the girls are crying because they're like, oh my gosh, you're gonna make this so much worse. Everybody's attention is towards the backyard. When they all turn around to look at the mantle, Matt thinking he had solved the problem, there is a figurine, an identical one of the cat that's sitting on the table again. They all gasp, they can't believe it and it doesn't make any sense. They watched Matt throw the figurine. Matt doesn't care, picks it up and throws it on the ground and smashes it right then and there. And it's just this crazy sequence of events that when you hear the firsthand interviews with Susan, she can barely describe this moment because you're seeing something reappear and then Matt is destroying it. It's like a very deliberate, aggressive act towards this thing in the house, the very opposite of what it was meant to do. And Susan would say that she knew they were gonna go through hell for that. That night after everybody finally fell asleep, Jamie wakes up in the middle of the night and goes down into the kitchen to get a snack. 
When she goes in there, she sees written all over the walls, everywhere, is the word cat. Everywhere. And she immediately runs upstairs. She gets her mom. She gets Matt and Marie. Everybody sees that there's this word cat written everywhere. Matt looks at Jamie and says, you're the one that found this. You did this. Susan comes to defend Jamie and says, you're the one, Matt, that smashed the cat figurine. There's no wonder this is happening. And so this horrible fight happens where they aren't seeing what's actually going on. They're just seeing red and fighting with each other. Meanwhile, they're blatantly being haunted. In addition to cat being written everywhere, the house had been completely ransacked. I mean, everything's been dumped out of drawers. Everywhere that you could make a mess, there had been a mess made. And no one woke up to it. They were all in bed. No one woke up to this much of a mess. It didn't make any sense. They start cleaning up this horrible mess. As they move some things aside in the kitchen, they find what looks to be a huge footprint. It is not Matt's footprint. It's certainly not one of the girl's footprints. It's easy for us to say, well, why didn't you go to the police? But you got to remember that when you're in real crisis mode, your brain will tell you that everything is fine. It will be in complete denial of things that are right in front of you because it's just, it's a coping mechanism. And so they did nothing and just let it continue. Susan desperately wanted to leave the house but she couldn't do it financially. They couldn't leave the house. They couldn't afford to, so they're trapped. At this point, the kids are getting very withdrawn. They don't wanna be in the house, so Marie would end up staying in her room all day. Jamie would do the same thing. Matt and Susan weren't talking. There was just nothing being done to correct the situation, and everybody was so upset and angry with each other. It was just a worst case scenario. So in the last couple of weeks that they ever stayed at this house, because they would leave, two major events occurred. The first one happened when Marie was home alone. She was only gonna be there for a couple hours by herself. And even though Susan and Matt did not wanna leave her alone, they didn't have another choice and, and Jamie wasn't there. So Marie's gonna be home alone and it's nighttime. So this is like straight out of a horror movie. She's sitting in the living room watching TV. And at some point the TV starts turning off and on. So off on, off on, off on. And she knows because she's been in this house now and seen the craziness that something bad's about to happen. And the TV finally just turns off. She can't get it on. She reaches for the remote. The remote flies off the table. And now she's just sitting there frozen because she knows that something's in the house with her. She watches as the rocking chair right in front of her just starts to rock back and forth as if the person or thing that had pulled away the remote had walked over and sat down in the rocking chair and was now looking at her rocking back and forth. Marie is looking at the rocking chair as all the pictures on the walls just start one by one falling off the wall. Marie and Jamie had a habit of always having having a digital camera with them at all times because they were taking pictures and filming everything strange happening in their house. And so as she's laying there, just absolutely horrified, she takes her camera in her hand and kind of turns it and just starts taking pictures of the room before running out of the room to get her phone where she calls Susan, she calls her dad, she calls everybody, she's screaming into the phone, you gotta get here, something's going on. And Susan flies home, Jamie flies home, they rush inside and they grab her and she's unhurt, but the house has once again been tossed. And then after it all kind of settles down, Marie says, I took pictures. And so Susan and Matt and Jamie look at these pictures. There are these weird orbs of light that are very clearly in the room with her that are moving around the room. She managed to get a couple pictures of them and they're just totally out of this world. At this point, Matt is convinced that there's something paranormal happening in the house. He's not even putting up the charade that this is Jamie, because it wasn't. It wasn't his daughter, it wasn't anybody. How can you explain these pictures? You can't. And so Matt decides, well, I don't know who we call for this, but I think you call, you call the church. And so he tried calling a bunch of priests and pastors and tried to get anybody to come over. And the best he could do was get a pastor to come over and pray with them before leaving and saying, we can't help you. And so they were totally on their own and they 
can't afford to leave. They know something horrible is happening here and they're just trapped. And finally, the second major event that occurred in those final two weeks happened to Jamie when she was home alone. Jamie was in her room and she starts hearing pounding on her door. She started filming this pounding on her door. There's no one home with her. And you just hear in her voice that she's terrified and someone is pounding over and over on the door, on her bedroom door. And at some point she knows she has to go into the hall. And so she goes over to the door, she's building the strength to reach down and open the door. And as soon as her hand would go near the doorknob, the pounding on the other side of the door would stop. Like it knew she was about to come out into the hall. And so she didn't open the door and she went back onto her bed and she just sat there in the fetal position for three hours, listening to something smashing nonstop into the door. At some point, the banging stops. And after a few minutes of the banging being done, she thinks this is her chance to escape the house. She opens the door and there's no one there, but the door on the outside where the knocking had been happening, there's this huge dent and divot in the door. And the door handle on the outside from the hallway side has been bent downward. On the ground in the hall is a pile of utensils, pots, pans, silverware, knives. Some, this thing had been using tools to try to open the door. Next door to her room was a bathroom and the bathroom door did not have a doorknob on it. You basically just pushed it shut, but there was a space for a doorknob that you could actually look through. They just hadn't put it on there yet. And she noticed in the bathroom that the light was flickering and she thought, I think it's in there. And she decides she's gonna try to trap this thing. So she goes to her desk where she had some string. She goes back over and loops the string through this hole in the door and leans back and pulls the door shut, thinking she's trapped this thing inside. As soon as she does, she starts feeling resistance on the door. Someone is pulling back. And at some point, the string gets cut and she falls back into her room. At which point, the bathroom door swings open and she says, I'm about to come face to face with something out of my nightmares. But before she could see this thing come out of the bathroom, her bedroom door slams shut and she hears the rustling of pans and tools and metal clinking against each other right outside her door. She knows this thing is interacting with all those tools and pots and pans right on the other side of her door. It's this horrifying thought. And after just a moment or two, she sees smoke coming into her bedroom. And so she immediately runs to the door to try to open it. And when she does, she sees that now there is a frying pan sitting in the hall that has a toilet paper roll completely on fire. And that there's been toilet paper strewn all over the hallway. Like this is a wick and it's gonna light the hallway on fire. She grabs a sweatshirt and she smothers the fire. At this point, she's in full survival mode. She knows she has to get out of this house. It's trying to kill her. And so she walks down this hall, pulling aside all of the toilet paper, getting ready to come face to face with this horrible thing. She goes into the living room. The whole thing has been covered in toilet paper, paper towels, papers have been strewn everywhere. This thing was trying to light the house on fire with her trapped inside. And so she manages to make her way through this maze of toilet paper. She sees there's no other fire set and she goes outside defeated and just sits on the front steps of her house waiting for her mom to come back. Susan, Matt and Marie were all together. So they came back and they saw Jamie sitting on the front steps, just crying. They go inside, they see the scene. Jamie explains what happens and that was it. They knew they were gonna have to go bankrupt to leave the house. They did not have the money to leave, but they had to leave. And so they barely packed up and they left that house. It didn't sell. Susan literally went bankrupt. And soon after they left the neighborhood, their neighbors left the neighborhood and five other neighbors in their immediate vicinity all left. All of the houses did not sell. They are all vacant. No one knows why. Susan, Jamie, Matt, and Marie, since leaving that neighborhood, even though they were ruined financially, they were very happy to get out of there. They've had no other paranormal activity since they left and they're just glad they got out of there with their lives. So I'd love to get your reaction to this story. What'd you think of it? What do you think happened? Let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to get back to as many of you as I possibly can. If you enjoyed today's story and you wanna hear more stories like it, then if you haven't done this already, please sneak into the bathroom the next time the like button is taking a shower and steal their towel and their clothes. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads.
If you have a story that you think would be a good fit for this channel, whether it's your personal story or just a story suggestion, please go to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked below in the description and submit it there. I read that subreddit every single day. So I will definitely see it if you put it on there.